This is Frankie Pace. This is the Frankie Pace Show. And my uh, guest now is the Professor of Fun. Yes, the Professor of Fun. His name is Tommy Moore. He's also written a book. It's called A Ph.D. in Happiness from the great comedians. Comedians like Jay Leno, Bob Hope, Jerry Lewis, Harry Anderson, Rosie O'Donnell, Johnny Carson, Steve Allen, Milton Berl, George Collins, Soupy Sales. Hold it, hold it. There's more. There's more. Bill Cosby, George Burns, Jack Benny, David Brenner, Jackie Mason, Billy Crystal, Jimmy Durante, Henny Youngman, Maury Amsterdam, Joey Bishop, Danny Thomas, Dick Gregory, Joan Rivers, Pat Paulson, Jackie Vernon, Shecky Green, Alan King, Don Rickles, Robin Williams, and many, many more. And we're going to talk to him tonight. Tommy Moore is here. He's going to talk about his book. We're going to talk about his life. It's been very interesting, and there's some sad points in it, too. So stick around. Don't go anywhere. Tommy Moore is next. Don't talk to me like that. Shut up. Shut up. Tommy, how are you, guy? Hey, Frankie Pace. You know, I heard you mention all those names. You didn't mention the most important name on page 122. Frankie Pace. <laughs> the name in there. Your name is in the book. Oh, thank you so much, my friend. <laughs> I haven't seen you in 20 years. People don't realize. People think because we're in show business, we see each other all the time. We work the same places. You're on your ship. I'm on my ship. We're two ships that pass in a night. The only difference is you're on a ship to the Mediterranean, the Caribbean, and I did five years on the Spirit of Philadelphia. We ported to places like Camden. Wow, Camden. Oh, my God, Camden. You're you're turning me on. That's all that matters. You're turning me on, Tommy. We had the buffet. I did three shows a day, one on each deck. The three buffets, I gained 20 pounds. Oh, wife put me on a diet immediately. She said, you got to go to a health club. Right? <laughs> so they sent me a letter. It says, for your first meeting, make sure you're wearing loose clothes. If I had loose clothes, would I need the health club? I know. I know. <laughs> now she says, you got to eat health food. Everything's yeah. got to be healthy. Yeah. Red meat is bad for you. That's not true. Red meat is not bad for you. Green meat with little blue fuzz, that's bad for you. Oh, I have that every night. What are you talking about? And my wife bought a juicer now. She juices everything. Last night, I drank a chicken last night. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> How are you? All right. Listen, I like your book. I like the first quote in your book. It's, uh, we all live with the same objective of being happy. Our lives are all different yet the same. And that was written by Anne Frank. Very interesting. That's right. I mean, happiness is what the book is about. Uh, I don't know what you want to ask me, but let me tell you, the reason I wrote the book is because people think that comedians are the happiest people in the world. And sometimes we cover our sadness by trying to make others happy. Well, you started off with a tragedy, actually. You were, uh, yeah, actually, do you I, feel you know, like you I want to talk about that? I was at the wrong time. I was in the middle of a robbery, and I wound up, uh, a guy hit me on the head with a pipe eight or nine times, I don't know, after seven you stopped counting, and he tied my hands behind the back, put a noose around my neck, he put a gag in the mouth, and he locked me in a room, left me for dead. And yeah. before he left, he said something I'll never forget. He said, don't try anything funny. You should never tell a comedian not to try anything funny. Also, I had been a magician. You should never tie up a magician. It only serves as a challenge. Ask Houdini, okay? Right, right. <laughs> and I got out of the bonds. Thank God. I prayed to God. He got me out of there. I spent the next three days in the hospital. Yeah. And every comedian on the East Coast either called me or visited my room and made me laugh. I took my mind off all my problems, all my troubles, and that's when I really realized how important laughter was. Now, one guy came in and uh, talked to the doctor, and the doctor said, Tommy Moore may never stand on the stage again. I said, really? You want to bet? I had been in show business at the time about 20 years, and I had never missed a show, and I wasn't about to miss one now. I had a show in three days. And I did that show in head-to-toe casts and bandages. I did the show to introduce me as direct from the emergency ward of Fitzgerald Mercy Hospital, Tommy Moore. I did the show, and since then I've done 3,500 shows. The book is about finding a dream and keeping your dream 
and not letting anything get you down. I, you know, like, like you mentioned, all those comedians, they taught me show business lessons that I realized translated very easily into real-life lessons. I mean, in the book, I talk about things about faith and worry and fear and hate and finding yourself and hope and gratitude and love and joy and following your dream and eliminating negativity. I was a very negative person until I realized that negativity gets you nowhere. you got to be happy. you got to be positive. And, you know, that, that, that's what helps you in life because we're all looking to be happy. Ask any parent. You know, you say, you want a boy or a girl, they say, I don't care as long as they're happy. If you have happiness, you have everything. And laughter can bring you happiness. You bring it, I bring it, comedians bring it, but people can bring it to each other. I mean, think, Bill Cosby said, you can turn a painful situation around through laughter. Mm -hmm. Pearl said, laughter is God's hand on the shoulder of a weary world. And that's what I'm trying to do with the book. There are three things I want to do with this book. Number one, I make people happier. Number two, I want to pass along the advice I got from 50 of the greatest comedians in the world that literally saved my life. And number three, I want to make people aware of the legends of comedy from a generation where comedians were simpler and happier and more fun. You and I know from working comedy clubs for, what, 35, 40 years now? Comedy has changed a little bit. Comedy used to be fun. The root word of funny is fun. Now comedy is very cynical and acerbic and bitter and angry, and that's not fun. That doesn't make people happier. I wanted to talk about the comedians who were happy. So I get, you know, I have people in there like Bob Hope and Jerry Lewis and Milton Berle and George Burns. You know, I mean, on and on and on. And I talk about all of this stuff in the book because it's happiness. Milton Berle said laughter is like a one-minute vacation. Because when you're laughing, you're not thinking of any of your problems, any of your worries. You're on a one-minute vacation. You don't have to pack. You don't have to go anywhere. You met uh, most of these uh, comedians, actually, from being a journalist. Isn't that true? Yeah, well, partially because for 11 years, I wrote a newspaper column called Comedy Corner, and I interviewed a lot of them. And for 40 years, I've been a comic and I performed with a lot of them, especially on TV. Because remember in the 80s when comedy was really hot and they put every comedian in the world on all these morning shows, they am Philadelphia, they am Cleveland, they am everything. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. If, if there was a big comedian in town, they would bring him in like an Alan King and then bring in a panel of five, six other young new comedians and uh, we would be on the dais together with him. That's another way I met a lot of comedians, Steve Allen, Joan Rivers, whatever. I'll tell you a quick story with Alan King. One of the important things about being happy is to be in control. Comedians know that. On stage, you're in control. Alan King and I did the Jane Whitney show, and Alan King was the focus of attention, and Alan King was going to be in Atlantic City. He leaned over to me during a commercial, and he said, how come you're not telling them where you're going to be? I said, well, the show's not really about me. It's about you. He said, right, oh, really? Right, right. When we came back from commercial, he said to Jane Whitney, Jane, before you do any more, I want you to ask him where he's going to be because he, he's, he's next year's comedy, and he's the future of comedy. Go see him. Don't come see me. Go see him. And I said to him later, why did you do that? He said, because I had to be in control. I couldn't let anybody else control what was going on. I had to be in control. And that's such an important thing, control. Think about it. There, there are two things that you're in control of, what you think and what you do. Everything else you like to try to be in control of, forget about it. You can't control your family, your friends. You try to, but you can't. Right, you can right. control what you think and what you do. And that's why people who are in the worst situations can still be happy because people who were, for instance, in a concentration camp, in a POW camp, if they could control what they were thinking, if they could think happy thoughts, they could make it through the day. A lot of people uh, think uh, most comics are nuts. Uh, we are. That's why we go up on stage. I mean, how do you feel about that, Tommy? I think everybody's nuts, but comedians you know, just admit it. You know, yeah, that's true. And, you know, we go up and we expose our nuttiness. I think our nuttiness is that we see so much that everybody else sees, but we have to express more. We have to get it out of our system. And when we express it, 
that's what makes everybody else laugh for the fact that we see it and we say it and they never thought about saying it and they said wow you were thinking the same thing i was thinking absolutely right i mean there's a line in uh, billy crystal's mr saturday night he said a comedian's job is when he sees bs to yell bs right right <laughs> because everybody else puts it in but a comedian says it a comedian says it out loud i talk about the power of a smile you remember edwin he once told me something he said if you smile in the mirror first thing every day and the first thing you see is yourself smile It'll be hard to be sad for the rest of the day. Mm. I've done, I, do, I do seminars like AT&T and DuPont and IBM, and I make people stand up, and I make them look at their fellow employees and smile, the biggest smile they can smile. And all of a sudden they realize they may have never seen their employee smile before. Right, right. They realize with that smile that they're a person, and the other guy's a person too. You did fundraisers, too. You did United Church of Christ, the B'nai B'rith, Knights of Columbus, UNICEF, Family Service Division for the Armed Forces. That's a lot of good stuff, Tommy. Yeah, I've got, you know, I thank God every day that I've done a clean act, and because I do a clean act, I can do churches, and I can do benefits, and I can do fundraisers. Uh, to see people come in and laugh and have fun, even in, even in a sad situation, and to override that sadness and to do something positive by raising money right, right. for thy causes, that's the greatest gift in the world. <clears throat> a little side story. And God knows the soldiers really need that today. They really do, these poor well, kids. I did, I did a USO tour in 92 of England, Germany, France, Belgium, the Netherlands, and uh, some of these guys would follow us on the bus to the next show just because they wanted to see it again. It was mm-hmm. wonderful to do those USO shows. Uh, uh, God bless those people because they sacrifice everything. How was your meeting with Jackie Mason? That must have been, that must have been interesting because <clears throat> Jackie, to me, is a little wacky. He says, uh, I love his quote here, I'm the greatest comedian in the world, only nobody knows it yet. <laughs> you know what? Jackie Mason, when he met me, said something that made me feel really good because he had a nice suit on it. He said, this suit you got from comedy? It made me feel good because it made me realize that I was starting to do good in the business and I can afford a good suit. Right, right. I realized that you should always try to compliment and say something nice to somebody to make them feel good. Mm -hmm. And and how you dress, dress to make yourself feel good. Yeah. Um, I knew this guy. His name was Len. And uh, he dressed in yellow baggy pants and a green baggy coat and a long orange tie. And when he put that on, he felt good. You know why? He was a hospital clown. Mm, that's interesting. And, and ever since I saw him, he, he taught me to be a hospital clown. And I helped found the more regional hospital clowns down here in North Carolina, where I live now. And uh, we visit about 40 to 50 patient rooms a week. And it's some of the most rewarding stuff because, again, with humor, when you go into a patient's room in the hospital... I mean, when you're in a hospital, think about it. You're thinking about your pain, your worries, your frustration, uh, your, your aches. Your... When a clown comes in, they take your mind off all that stuff for five minutes, and that might be the best five oh, minutes sure, of the day. Sure. I'm going to tell you a quick story about that, all right? True story. Uh, the nurses tell us as clowns which rooms to go to and which rooms to avoid because they may be on heavy meds or they may be sleeping. So there was one room we were supposed to avoid. We walked by, but the woman who was uh, the visitor in the room motioned us in. So uh, it's a command performance. We went in, mm-hmm. and she said to her husband, who was this, wake up, honey, wake up, there are clowns here. And he opened his eyes, and he looked at us, and we did our two, three minutes of, you know, jokes and magic tricks. Right. And he barely smiled. And on the way out, the woman is thanking us profusely. And we said, well, you're welcome, but we really didn't do that much. She said, you don't understand. This is the first time he's opened his eyes in two months. Wow. That's what happiness can do. That's what laughter can do. You do it. You make people feel better every time you walk on stage. Well, I'm bald and I'm short and I'm fat. What do you want from me? No, you're funny. (laughs) Funny, funny man. Uh, <clears throat> so Don Rickles, that must have been interesting meeting Don Rickles and uh, 
He talked about how the young comics are in such a hurry to become stars, but yeah, not, not taking the time to hone their skills. Uh, some things just take time, like art. Uh, that's a pretty interesting quote by Don Rickles. Yeah, I mean, Don Rickles took years and years to become famous. Mm. But he said, you know, I see you guys in the comedy clubs, and a lot of guys are good, and they quit after two, three years because they're not making it. The guys who hang in there are the guys who are going to make it. When he first started out, he didn't even want to be a comedian. He wanted to be an actor. He went to uh, acting school and it didn't work out. So he tried being an MC and he worked strip clubs for five years, little crappy strip clubs. Mm -hmm. Maury Amsterdam, he was another one. Maury. Maury Amsterdam <coughs> taught me how to find the joy in anything. You find the joy the same way you find jokes. Let me show you what I mean. He taught me how to routine jokes. He said, let's say, for instance, you're doing a routine about marriage. He said, first you got marriage jokes, okay. Then you got engagement jokes. Then you got to buy a ring. You got to joke about a ring. Then you got to rent a tuxedo. Right, right. You got to joke about a ring. The same way you find the jokes is the way you find the joy. Look for the joy in your job. I'll tell you a story about a 17-year-old kid who taught me something. And sometimes you don't think a teenager can teach an adult anything, but he taught me something. I asked him, you know, how you do on stage? What do you do for a living? And the kid said, uh, I work at McDonald's. And I said, what do you make? He said, I make hamburgers. I said, no, no. <clears throat> and how much do you make an hour? And he said, no, I don't look at it that way. He said, I make hamburgers. And I wrap them up and I put them down the chute. And I wait to see who takes them. And sometimes a little kid takes them. And I follow them with my eye. And I wait for him to unwrap it and take a first bite. And sometimes the kid smiles. He says, I make hamburgers and I make people smile. Mm, that's nice. That's wise nice. kid. Yeah. Very yeah. wise kid. And what, what turned you on to comedy? Was it the old shows like uh, Skeleton, The Honeymooners? Yeah. Or I mean, Ed Sullivan? Uh, uh, the Hollywood Palace. Uh, just watching all those comedians. Right here are our show tonight. Ed Sullivan. I bet you like Ed Sullivan, right? Eh? Oh, I love Ben Sullivan. As a matter of fact, this is very strange. When I moved here to North Carolina. I wondered if there was anybody who was going to give a darn about show business enough to talk. Because you know how we love to talk about show business. Right. Other comedians. The guy next door, my next door neighbor, was the associate producer of the Ed Sullivan <laughs> show. I'm in heaven. Boy, that fell right in your lap, didn't it? <laughs> that, that was a gift from God. I oh, mean, yeah. Unbelievable. You know, but, I mean... There were two reasons why I became a comedian. One was serious, one was not so serious, not so altruistic. All right. Uh, the serious reason was this. I remember being a little kid, and I was very sick, about age five. And uh, I had like 104 and a half fever. And the uh, doctor even said, if it goes higher than that, they're going to have to put him in a bathtub and put ice on him. Okay. I begged my parents to let me come downstairs and just watch TV because I was going nuts sick in my room. They let me come downstairs. They turned on the TV, and there was a show with Jimmy Durante, one of the great comedians of all time. I think he, I think Jimmy Durante was not only a comedian, but I think he was more of an entertainer. Entertainer. He, he was a singer. He was a right. dancer. He told jokes. I mean, he was and an all around guy. He was a total entertainer back yeah. in the days when you had to be a total entertainer. Yeah. And I watched him, and <clears throat> in, the, in the fifteen minutes that I watched him, it took my mind off all my pain. And I realized, wow, if I could ever do that for another human being, that would be the greatest calling in the world. That is the moment when I wanted to be a comedian. Now, that's the altruistic part. The other not-so-altruistic part was I once heard that Jack Carter made $5,000 in 1952 on the Ed Sullivan Show for five minutes. And I said, $5,000 for five minutes and there's no heavy lifting? I like this. <laughs> this is my kind of job. <laughs> look, at my, look at me right now. I'm on the radio. I didn't even have to shave. That's terrific. <laughs> I'm sitting here in my shorts. I'm watching a lake with a fountain in it, and I'm on the radio. <laughs> so what's, uh, what's Tommy Moore up to these days, huh? Well, Tommy Moore is doing banquets. Tommy Moore is doing uh, fundraisers. Tommy Moore, I'm doing a lot of church shows. Mm -hmm. With the book, uh, I'm doing a book tour. And I'm doing I'm doing a lot of afternoon shows, which is very weird because I'm a nightclub guy. I got an afternoon show tomorrow, and uh, I'm doing senior citizen bus tours, and it, it it's just it's a ball. I'm having a ball every day in my life, and I thank God I'm doing this because it just it 
couldn't be any better. It, do, you, do you miss Philadelphia at all? I miss Philadelphia the way it used to be. Yeah, me too. Me too. Now, I, there, was a, there was a place in Philadelphia called Palumbo's. Palumbo's was the oldest, longest-running nightclub in America. Right. If you, if, you made it, if you made it at Palumbo's, you made it in Philly. I was the last Philadelphia comedian to perform at Palumbo's, and my father and mother had the joy of seeing me there because you're right. If you were at Palumbo's, you made it. And I, I did Palumbo's a dozen times, and I was the last Philadelphia yeah. to be there. Well, you seem you you have to have you have everything going for you right now. You seem you you know where you're destined to be, and you're helping a lot of people, and it's a good thing. And uh, thank you. Uh, I yep, give you uh, I give you a lot of you know a lot of credit for that, man. And I I appreciate you coming on the show and and spending your time to uh, to give me that moment. <clears throat> if anybody of, wants to uh, read the book, it's on Amazon. It's on Kindle. Uh, it's called Happy uh, PhD in Happiness from the Great Comedians. And thank, I want to thank everybody who gave me reviews on Amazon because people are saying it changed their life. People are saying it changed their outlook. People are saying it pulled them out of depression. And that, that's the most wonderful thing in the world for me to hear. I'm so, I'm, I'm so gifted to be able to hear that by God. Well, you are gifted, and God did give you the gift, and it's working. And uh, I wish you all the best. And thanks for coming on the show, Tommy. You're, you're a great Good, my guy. Friend. Start the bone. All right, take care of yourself, huh? All right, God bless That's you. Tommy care. Moore. If you want to get into his book, it's on Amazon.com, like he said. A PhD in Happiness from the Great Comedians, A Lesson in Life from Jay Leno, Bob Hope, and on and on and on. This is Frankie Pace on The Frankie Pace Show.